Okay, so while you're getting seasick, I'll set my timer. Um, okay, so uh, my goal is to try to share uh, some stories about studies we've been doing recently from a very global perspective. And um, it's exciting because for me as an as a ecologist and evolutionary biologist, uh, it's neat to really rethink kind of uh, a lot of the paradigms that exist in our world, and in particular to do that at something as ridiculous as the global scale. Um, this is the outline of my talk. I'll first try to excite you about why we should bother studying viruses and microbes and then briefly mention that it was really hard to do for quite a while and now it's much easier to do. Uh, and then I'll share some of the patterns and processes that, that we're learning about with respect to viruses in the oceans. And finally, I'll touch upon two paradigms. So we often think of viruses of, of microbes um, in the context lately of uh, the microbes that infect humans. There's a lot of information and excitement about the human microbiome, and it turns out in the last couple of years, viruses are also important to that equation. But in other environments like soils, microbes are important uh, for um, remineralizing nutrients that help plants grow. And uh, if you've been breathing at all today, then half of the oxygen and the, the air that you've been breathing has come from microbes that are in the oceans, small phytoplanktonic cells. For many years, we thought that viruses in the oceans were not actually that important, um, and that was because people had used cultures which were perhaps inappropriate for isolating viruses. And then we started to concentrate viruses onto seawater. I say we, this is before my time, this is in, in 1989. Uh, they first looked at viruses on filters and saw um, when you use heavy uh, fluorescent staining methods, you'll see small dots and big dots. And the small dots here are viruses and the big dots are cells. And if you swallow a mouthful of seawater, there's a lot of viruses in it, about 50 million viruses. Um, some other numbers that we've come to realize uh, broadly as a field is that very few of these can be cultured, less than about 1%. Um, if you do tracer experiments and bottle incubation experiments, it looks like about a third of cells that are in the oceans are infected at any given time. And um, really largely from one measurement in the Florida estuary, if you extrapolate that to the globe, it suggests that viruses are transducing or moving a lot of genes, uh, 10 to the 29th genes. So viruses can play a large impact in impacting microbial evolution. I'm interested in getting at sort of maybe one step further and asking questions about how viruses impact ecosystems. And I'm particularly interested in sort of the current uh, state that the Earth is in. Um, this is a plot that was made famous by um, Al Gore in, in a, a movie where this shows sort of the last 400,000 years of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere cycling as high as 300 parts per million um, until recently. And recently, we not only broke the 300 parts per million uh, barrier, but uh, two years ago, we broke the 400 parts per million barrier. So we're increasing carbon dioxide on the planet to levels that haven't been seen in 650,000 years. And you can see that the rate uh, at the end of that plot is also alarmingly fast. And I mentioned that viruses, or sorry, that microbes in the oceans are uh, producing half the oxygen you breathe. They're doing that through photosynthesis by fixing a lot of carbon. And so the oceans actually are, are saving us from anthropogenic input of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which occurs at a rate of something between seven and 10 gigatons per year. Uh, the oceans are saving us by absorbing half of that carbon dioxide. So remember to thank the oceans for protecting us from the carbon dioxide we as humans are putting in the atmosphere. This is important not just for the oceans um, where it acidifies and warms the oceans. That changes weather patterns. We're gonna get more extreme weather events. Um, it's also uh, Im important in the context of the microbes driving a lot of this carbon dioxide fate um, through microbial food webs, and we would think perhaps through viral impacts on those microbial food webs. So the work I'll tell you about is focused on ocean viruses as essentially uh, a model to, and a roadmap to understand viruses of microbes generally, and we're now applying these kinds of tools and studies in humans, uh, bioreactors, and soils. So why is it that people hadn't studied viruses of microbes in complex communities very much? And it turns out um, the first question, who is there, was difficult to answer. Viruses don't have a gene that's shared across all viral types. So you can't just do a simple gene marker PCR-based amplification and understand what kind of diversity exists. Um, 
We spent six and a half years developing quantitative viromic methods. This was initially for double-stranded DNA viruses. We've since uh, optimized it for single-stranded DNA viruses, and um, we're currently working on RNA viruses. But if you use this quantitative viromic framework, uh, you can actually begin to answer questions about who is there or counting them using different approaches. You can use it at the level of sort of sequence characteristics to develop hypotheses about community ecology and, and drivers. You can organize that sequence space into genes or protein clusters and look at gene ecology. Or we've recently been developing population level studies or genome resol resolve studies um, at both the species and genus level. And, and I use those terms very uh, explicitly because the work we've done is carefully grounded in both population genetics for the species argument and uh, comparative benchmarking to the ICTV for the genus discussion. So I think at this point, we can actually go out and count and look at distributions of viruses at the Kamer or sequence composition level, the gene level, and populations at multiple levels. Anyone can do this now. Um, the other nice thing we've tried to do is develop community-available tools at an NSF-funded cyber infrastructure called Cyverse, um, and this has really been the baby of the, the three folks mentioned here, and there's, there's only one figure in this paper, but it walks you through the workflow for analyzing viromic-centric data. I'll just mention that the compute at Cyverse is, is both large and free. Um, extensive documentation exists at protocols.io. This is a place where community, communities can, can um, uh, live feedback on different uh, benchmarking and, and other measurements. And then um, Simon Rue in particular has tried to pioneer consistent standard efforts, and, and one of the more recent ones was uh, a benchmarking paper he put out uh, in PureJ recently. And we recently wrote a proposal together um, trying to actually integrate this iVirus effort with IMGVR, and so if we get funded, we'll hope to be connecting into some of the powerful new resources that JGI is putting together. So we've got this quantitative uh, toolkit. What kinds of things are we learning? I mentioned that uh, we're interested at, at sort of these large uh, scales, and so this was, this was our fancy research vessel. Uh, the back end of this boat, it is a sailboat, uh, but it was a free sailboat that allowed us to sail around the world and sample systematically. This is a huge effort uh, from the Tar Oceans Consortium. Many PIs involved, and I'm, I'm just one of many. And the idea is that um, you have a sailboat that goes around the world, um, and at each of those red dots, the boat stops for about 24 to 48 hours and throws this thing in the top right in the water. It's called a CTD. And that CTD essentially has 10 liter or so bottles that can be fired off at different depths and allows you to sample the water. I mentioned this effort to really be both quantitative and systematic in our sampling to allow these data sets to be intercomparable. And there's a number of papers that came out, which I won't describe, that um, really look into fundamental ecological questions like what are the drivers of community structure, um, and uh, testing some hypotheses that were in the literature about a decade at that point. Instead, I'll focus more on sort of the, the virosphere, um, and this is meant to pictorialize the number of viral genomes that were known when we started our study. In this case, each of these viruses represents about 1,000 viral genomes. Um, when we were done with our studies, or at least at the time I made this slide, we had uh, successfully put together quite a bit more of that viral sequence space and augmented the existing databases about 15-fold. These are not all complete viral genomes. They are, they are many complete and large viral genome fragments. This is a challenge to work with taxonomically, so we, uh, we co-opted um, Gypsy Lima Mendez and Ariane Toussaint's network-based taxonomy that had been in the literature since 2008. And, and this has been incredibly powerful. This is monopartite network analytics as compared to Eugene's earlier discussion of the bipartite network analytics. Both of these, I think, are really powerful new ways that um, the field's pushing towards automated viral taxonomy. And when we look at those networks, we can estimate the number of viral clusters in that network. And when we look at what those viral clusters are, they're almost completely concordant to ICTV genera. So this plot is a, is a collector's curve, if you will, of these global ocean viral samples along the x-axis and the number of viral clusters or viral genera. And so hopefully you can see that this is a pretty well sampled plot. I never thought we'd see uh, this level of saturation 
of a collector's curve. It suggests there's probably about 800 viral genera in the global oceans. There's two caveats to that. One is this is a double-stranded DNA data set. And the two is, um, I think, some nice work from the uh, Spanish group and, and some of the single virus genomics efforts are showing that assembly-based viral metagenomics will miss some microdiverse populations. So we'll see this grow some, but it's nice to see such solid sampling at this point. The other humbling element, of course, is no sooner had we had our data set together and we're excited to try to get it published and, and the JGI mined their microbial metagenomes or their microbiomes and found well over 100,000 uh, viral genomes. So our ocean data pales in comparison to the global data set. But that's exciting to see so much uh, viral genomic cataloging happening. So for the oceans, with this well-sampled catalog as our, as our baseline, we decided to look at our data set in the context of the ecological uh, uh, transect that we were looking at. And, and this is just to show us that we can use um, uh, these arrows represent tracking of viral populations genomically from one sample site, each of the numbered circles is a sample site, to another. And, and the arrows, um, not surprisingly, suggest that viruses essentially ride the major ocean currents. So we can see flow of viruses moving from one site to another, and the direction of that flow is consistent with the known physics of these systems. That's not surprising. My grandma could have told me that before we went out and spent a lot of time looking at this. Um, another interesting element was that these abundances in each of the sites um, varied quite a bit and looked to be driven by local processes. So we have um, the paradigm in ecology suggesting that everything is everywhere and the environment selects, and, and our data are certainly consistent with that. These viral populations in the oceans seem to be globally distributed, and their, their local abundances are, are driven by local processes. Out of this data set, we can also begin to identify some of the major players, and this first major player I was excited to see, one of the most abundant viral types is phage T4, or at least T4-like phages, and I was excited to see them, of course, because they're the basis of a lot of molecular biology, but I'd also, uh, they're near and dear to my heart from uh, many studies during my PhD and postdoc. Another one of the most abundant viruses is phi 38 one Has anyone ever heard of that? Yes. Excellent. We're changing the world. Three people have heard of it. <laughs> You'll hear more about it later. Um, so just keep in mind, it was an abundant virus in these ocean data sets. So those are just a tip of the iceberg look at, at um, some of the patterns that are out there. The next thing we're interested in as, as oceanographers in particular is what sort of processes are viruses impacting? And, and we'd had a, a um, once very carefully looked at process was photosynthesis in the oceans. Through about a decade of work, uh, many different groups, it turned out that viruses that infected this green, happily growing Prochlorococcus, or cyanobacterial cell in the ocean, viruses that infected them had genes that tied into the core metabolisms of photosynthesis. In particular, I'll, I'll highlight a gene called PSBA. That gene makes the D1 protein in the photosystem two, which turns over very rapidly. The idea is the virus, when it infects this cell, shuts down the cell's ability to make its own proteins. But the virus wants the photosystem to be maintained, and within a half an hour, it's degraded that protein due to its proximity to oxygen radical formation. The virus inserts its own version of that protein into the photosystem to be able to maintain and make more viruses, because it hangs out in that cell not for a half an hour, but for 12 to 18 hours. So this is an example that was well worked out in culture-based systems, showing that viruses steal and co-opt key metabolic genes, probably just for their own end. So this allowed photosynthetic viruses of these photosynthetic cells to maintain photosynthesis to make more viruses. So could that be a, a more generalizable phenomenon? These, uh, these things that we call auxiliary metabolic genes, uh, and I mentioned the photosynthesis case, if you go and look in viral metagenomic data sets, you can actually see that there's a lot more going on. So um, in, in an early data set, uh, Bonnie Hurwitz had pioneered looking at um, central carbon metabolism and found 35 uh, stolen auxiliary metabolic genes in viruses. And no one virus has all these genes. The viruses are tuned to particular hosts and whatever the metabolic bottleneck is in that host for making more viruses. 
It's not just carbon-related genes. There's also sulfur cycling genes. In fact, quite a number of sulfur cycling genes have now been found throughout uh, surface ocean waters as well as really sort of extreme environments uh, near vents. And we've also found a number of genes involved in both global regulation and um, nitrogen storage compounds with respect to nitrogen cycling. One thing I will mention is that if you're doing a viral metagenome or a virome and you find a cool host gene that you really care about, make sure it's on a viral contig. It turns out many viromes, in fact all, have bacterial contamination. That really cool finding could be nothing more than another boring bacterial metabolic gene. So make sure it's on a viral contig. And, and uh, Simon pioneered some, some benchmarks uh, in a two papers to try to really put together um, some good thinking on, on how to be careful about those kinds of analyses. So um, we then wanted to sort of explore, you know, how is this really changing our thinking? Um, and so the two paradigms I'll present, the first one is the idea that the viral shunt keeps carbon small. Um, so I showed this earlier and I said my grandma could have told us this story. And what I didn't tell you is that in each of these circles, not only did we look at gene flow or, or populations from one site to another, we also looked at them going down. And the X's that just came on are the viruses going down. So many of these sites, it looked like viruses were sinking. And um, it turns out viruses shouldn't sink. Very low Reynolds number, they should not sink. So, so what's going on? So um, Jen did some, Jen Brum did some uh, careful work looking at the literature and, and found some curious hypotheses that I had forgotten about from a review that Marcus Feinbauer had put together in, in 2004. And, and then she pictorialized it in this, um, this set of uh, slides. So the paradigm is that bacteria and phytoplankton are infected by viruses. That lyses cells and creates particulate and dissolved organic matter that's rapidly recycled by heterotrophs. And so this is what's known as the viral shunt. And, and so the field, um, since this came out a couple decades ago, was, was focused on the idea that viruses probably lead to higher recycling of nutrients in surface waters. And, and we're seeing those viruses sinking. So Marcus Weinbauer had suggested, well, maybe actually viruses um, do produce those sort of blown up cells, but perhaps those cells aggregate. Uh, and those aggregates then have a much higher Reynolds number and could have viruses stuck in them and could sink out of the water column. And so that could be a way that viruses could appear to be sinking. Because of course those aggregates as they go down through the water column are juicy substrates for microbes to degrade, and so they might end up in our viral fraction metagenomes. Intriguingly, at the same time, there's another way viruses could sink. Uh, there's, there's actually now, I think, um, one or two papers both for and against this idea, but um, there are virus-infected cells which appear to be preferentially grazed. So if they were preferentially grazed, they can end up in the fecal matter of lar larger organisms and, and appear to sink. So in tar oceans, there was a sort of meeting of the minds. This is a, a joke of two oceanographers and two theoreticians walk into a bar and out comes genes to ecosystems modeling. But um, this was four co-first authors really thinking at a, at a high level about how to use and leverage all of tar oceans organismal data sets and, and metadata. And um, what they were interested in is, is thinking about this map. This map is a map of carbon flux that was um, measured indirectly um, through uh, the tar oceans transect. And you've got the transect with the white dots at the top and then down through the water column and the three dimensionality. And the hot spots of, of red colors are high carbon flux and the cold spots are the blue uh, colors. And so the simple question was which organisms in this large data set um, best predict or drive carbon export in the oceans. And so um, they developed a novel uh, analytic which levered, leveraged quite a bit of uh, different um, aspects of the data. And I wouldn't tell this story probably if it weren't true, but viruses better than any other organism uh, best predicted carbon flux. In fact, they present, pre predicted 89% of the variation in carbon flux in the entire ecosystem, the entire global oceans. So this, um, we think, is consistent with the idea that, yes, viral lysis does form these aggregates, and these aggregates are sinking out of the water column, and that's a major driver of carbon flux in the surface ocean. So, so at the end of the day, don't just thank the oceans for protecting us from atmospheric carbon dioxide. Also thank their viruses. Um, 
we are firmly grounded in experiments in, in my group, and so uh, Sherry Flogey had pre pre she'd presented the idea of trying to experimentally test this uh, using stable isotope probing measurements. And, and when she uh, looked at this both in a mock community and a natural food web, um, she saw indeed quantifiable evidence of this viral shunt occurring at a low level and the viral shuttle occurring at a higher level. So the idea that viruses can move carbon into bigger stuff. The last point I want to make here is that um, this informatics that that team of four folks developed is, um, is a nice predictive tool that is highly generalizable. We were interested in predicting carbon flux in the oceans, but you could be interested in predicting disease or soil health or product yields. So any set of arenas where you had a lot of organismal data and metadata, you could be thinking about looking at the drivers both at the organismal level and uh, in that paper they also looked at the metabolic pathways that were um, best predictors. So we turn that sort of idea that viruses um, keep, viral shunt keeps carbon small idea a little on its head, um, and we're, we're still trying to think about how to continue to quantitatively attack that experimentally. But that's the first paradigm. The second paradigm I, I wanna walk us through um, takes us a step away from the viral metagenomic data sets and uh, thinks more about isolate-based uh, genomic analyses. And, and this paradigm is that phage resistance is really simple. So uh, this is work of a t very talented postdoc, Christina Howard Verona, who um, in this case we're thinking about uh, a cell and the ways that it could become resistant could be at the level of absorption, some sort of internal defenses, uh, many of which we've heard of like CRISPR and others which people think about a little bit less like abortive infections. And um, another way you can imagine phages not infecting a host very well or essentially being uh, uh, incapable of infection would be through mismatch utilization of, of host machinery. You're not able to take over the host cell well. And if we think about a broad base of phage biological literature, when we try to ask the question, what is the underlying mechanism of phage resistance, uh, I think we often find the answer is simple. It's, it's a single change due to a genetic mutant which leads to resistance. And that's that's because the way that we did those studies asks the cells uh, to, and to be looking at a single abrupt change. And, and so we were interested, is that also true in nature where you can imagine numerous changes could occur um, in the natural setting? And so uh, Christina's design was to look at um, this, this, uh, this virus that I mentioned earlier, 5381, because it was so abundant in the ocean, she wanted to start to study it in the lab to think about uh, mechanistic ecology. And she was interested in this phage as well because it infected um, one host well and one host poorly. So on the left is our original host. We get nice clean plaques. Uh, we get a, a great one-step growth curve. Phage production, which in our world was pretty fast, within 80 minutes. Uh, and then on the alternative host, uh, the same number of phage particles gives you a very poor and not well-resolved plaques. Uh, you can't even see a one-step growth after four hours of uh, infection. We used uh, a, a single cell based measurement called phage fish where we could tell that this wasn't just lysogeny, so these weren't just phages integrating into the alternate host cell. Uh, this is really an inefficient lytic infection. And she was interested in thinking about what is it that's happening? Why is it that it's infecting the alternative host poorly? This is our same uh, schematic of a cell, and, and we've used uh, a lot of different measurements to evaluate this. So what she found in this, uh, this cell that was these two cells that were isolated from the same waters, um, she found that the phage that infects one host well and the other host poorly fails at the step of adsorption. So we get 30% poorer adsorption. And we can see that with adsorption kinetics measurements. But it also fails at um, just a level of successful infection, uh, we think due to a restriction modification system blocking. And, and we could see that signature in the genome-wide transcriptomic data, uh, as well as through our phage fish measurements. And curiously, the host that it infected poorly was also defending well against the phage DNA and protein, both by degrading and stalling its production. And so, honestly, every way I could have imagined this host being inefficiently infected, it was doing. This was really interesting to me. So we didn't create a genetic mutant. This is what I call nature's mutants, revealing to us 
how is it that in natural systems, resistant to phages occur? And, and it suggests that in natural systems, the phage-host interaction and resistance is not simple at all, and there's many levels at which they might be uh, inefficient. So when I think about sort of host range leaps, um, it gives me a new respect for that phage that is able to leap from one host to another, because it probably has to overcome a number of different uh, uh, steps. So I hope you leave thinking, wow, viruses really are these tiny nanoscale entities with global scale impacts, and most of the people in this room are already converted, so we don't need to worry about that. But um, I've told you today that there's quantitative sampling methods, both for double-stranded DNA and single-stranded DNA viruses, and we're working on RNA viruses. Uh, we've established a global catalog uh, that, with some caveats, suggests there's about 800 ocean viral genera. Uh, for context, that's something like threefold the cu current number uh, accepted at ICTV. We developed an automatable genome-based taxonomy, and I didn't mention it, but it's placed into that community available iVirus, uh, so anyone can actually input their new viruses into this network-based taxonomy. And uh, explored some of the ways that viruses directly manipulate key host metabolisms through the uh, auxiliary metabolic genes. We've used that catalog of viral sequences to establish an understanding uh, with genes ecosystems-based modeling for uh, drivers of the carbon flux. Viruses are major drivers of that carbon flux. And some follow-on experiments using isotope probing suggest that, uh, indeed, there's quantifiable uh, shunt and shuttling of carbon due to viruses. And finally, uh, we, we have explored what virus host interactions, uh, how they fail in nature, and it suggests that they fail at, at multiple steps instead of just one single step. Um, a lot of the people in this room did this work uh, and, and, and or our collaborators, and uh, I really want to thank particularly the Moore Foundation and the Joint Genome Institute who've taken uh, a lot of high-risk, high-reward projects and really uh, grown with me through the years. Thanks for your time.